Module 9 will guide you through how to create paginated reports in Power BI. These types of reports are designed to be printed and or published. They can also be exported to PDF, PowerPoint, and they are formatted to fit well on a page. They will display all of the data in a table, even if it spans multiple pages. And when you export them or print them, you will see that that table will span multiple pages. With regular report visualizations in Power BI, if you use the table visualization on a regular non-paginated report, and that table spans multiple pages, when you print it or export it, it's only going to print or export what it sees on the screen, meaning you won't get the whole table printed or exported. Paginated reports are only available in premium workspaces. And in this module, you'll learn how to make a workspace a premium workspace. And we'll be accessing a sample data set from within the Power BI service for this module. In order to create paginated reports in Power BI service, you need Power BI Report Builder. It's a separate application. When we get into the service, I'll show you how you can gain access to it and download it. It's the only authoring tool for paginated reports. This is the only game in town where you can create them. You use the report builder to develop reports, preview them, and then you end up publishing the reports to the service. You can add those reports to a dashboard in your service. Report Builder is a developer tool. It's not meant as a report consumption tool. So once you publish your paginated report to the service, you can put it on a dashboard and distribute that so users have access to it. So when we get into the service, I'll show you how you can download Report Builder, or I've already put a link in the website links for additional information document in the video description. So in this module, we're going to use the Power BI Report Builder to create paginated reports. We're going to design a multi-page report layout. We're going to define a data source and a data set within Report Builder. We'll publish our report to the service, and then we'll use the export feature so you can see how it exports as a PDF. So I'm back in the service and I'm in my Power BI video workspace. And the first thing we want to do is bring in some sample data from Microsoft. If you look in the lower left corner, you'll see that arrow that seems to be pointing right. And that arrow, if you hover over it, it says get data. We're going to click on that arrow. If I scroll to the bottom of this screen, under more ways to create your own content, I am going to click on samples. And these are some sample data sources that they have within Microsoft. We're going to look for the supplier quality analysis sample tile and click on that. And it brings up a subsequent sc screen. You can learn more about it. It tells you about this data that's in here, and we're going to click on connect. So it says in your upper right hand corner, it's importing data. It could take a little while. In my case, it didn't take very long at all. And when I look in my Power BI video workspace, I have both the supplier quality analysis report and the supplier quality analysis sample data set. Let's click on the link to go to the report. So this one comes with a lot of visuals already in it. As you'll see on the left side, we have three pages of visualizations. And I'm going to navigate to the top bottom analysis page. Just to point out, there's a table on this page and it has a scroll bar in it. So you know all of this table data would not fit on one page if you were to print it. So let's just see that. This is a regular Power BI report. We haven't learned how to create the paginated report yet. 
but we want to see what this will look like if we were to print it. To show it in print preview, I'm going to do the drop down for file and choose print this page. And it will open up the print preview window for me. So when I scroll down print preview, you see that it's not showing everything in that table. This is print preview. It's showing the scroll bar, but you can't scroll in print preview for that. So this is the difference between a basic Power BI report visualization and a paginated report. And I'm going to just cancel the print preview. Now I'm ready to turn my workspace into a premium workspace so that when I build the paginated report, I can publish it to a premium workspace. So what I'm going to do on the left side is I'm going to go to my workspaces icon. I'm going to hover over my Power BI video. I don't know if you're using my workspace or another one, but whichever one you're using where you put the sample data is the one that you want to make a premium workspace. I'm going to go to the more button on the right side of my workspace and access workspace settings. On the top, I'm going to click on the premium tab and I'm going to choose premium per user. So you have two premiums there. You have premium per user, premium per capacity. In the first module, we talked about the different licensing and subscription types. I have premium per user. So I'm going to go ahead and click save and it's letting you know that you're changing workspace access. So only people who have premium per user licenses will be able to access this workspace. Anybody that has any type of premium uh, licensing will be able to access this workspace. But the reason why we're doing this is because you can only publish paginated reports to a premium workspace. So I'm going to click on continue. And when I go back to my workspaces, you'll see that it has the little diamond icon next to Power BI video. And that indicates that it is now a premium workspace. I'm going to navigate back to my workspace, my Power BI video premium workspace. And I'm going to just use the link in the upper right hand corner to get back to it. In order to access Report Builder, we're going to click on New. And when you click on Paginated Report, if you do not have Report Builder, a splash screen will open with a download button. Feel free to pause this video so you can download it and we'll continue with the module. Since I already have it, when I click on Paginated Report, it's going to launch Power BI Report Builder. On the splash screen for new report, they have four, they actually have three wizards there, table or matrix wizard, chart wizard, map wizard, or you can do a report from scratch. We're going to use the table or matrix wizard. So I'm going to just click on that. And the first screen that comes up is to choose a data set. We're going to connect to the supplier quality analysis data set that's in our premium workspace. So we're going to just do the next button in the lower right hand corner. And it says choose a connection to a data source. We don't have any connections listed here. So we're going to click on the new button. And we're going to name our data source here where it says data source one. We're going to just name it supplier quality analysis. And underneath that, where it says select connection type, it defaults to Microsoft SQL server. We're going to do the drop down and we're going to choose power BI data set. In the connection string area to the right, you're going to click on build. So it's going to bring up this screen, select the data set from the Power BI service, right? It's looking at, it has a listing of all your workspaces on the left. I'm going to go to my Power BI video workspace 
and I'm going to click on supplier quality analysis sample and then choose the select button in the lower right hand corner. So now you'll notice that the connection string is dimmed out, but it's filled with data. And we're going to test the connection before we continue by clicking the test connection button. It's always a good idea to test your connection. It lets me know that the connection was created successfully. So I'm going to click OK. And then I'm going to click OK again. And now it shows supplier quality analysis as my data source connection. And I'm going to do the next button in the lower right hand corner. In the new table or matrix dialog box, it says design a query. Build a query to specify the data you want from the data source. We're going to do just that. If we had this in Power BI Desktop, these would be all of the things that you would see in the fields pane under model on the left hand side. In that list, we're going to expand vendor by clicking the plus sign in front of it. And then we have another vendor that shows up that also can be expanded. Expand that one as well. And then you'll actually see the field name vendor. It has like one little dot in front of it. We're going to click and hold on that field and drag it right into this space over here and drop it. So now it just shows vendor there. On the left side under model, we're going to expand measures and then expand metrics. And there are two that we're going to want to choose from here and we're going to drag it into the query window. The first is total defect quantity. So we're going to grab that and drag it to the right of vendor. Notice it puts a guideline there so it won't let you overlay it. And the other one we want, the other measure that we want is total downtime minutes. I'm going to drag that into the query window as well. These are the three fields that we're going to want. So in the middle of your query window, you can click on click to execute the query and it will show you the underlying data. We're going to go ahead and click next. This screen allows us to arrange the fields to group the data in rows, columns, or both and choose values to display. In the available fields list on the left, you're going to double click on vendor and it goes into row groups. If you wanted it in column groups, you could just drag it from available fields to column groups, but it defaults to rows. And we're going to use our two measures as values. It knows their values. So if we double click them, it will put both of them in the values box. And the default value calculation is the sum function. If you do the drop down next to either of those measures, you'll see the other functions that are available. We're going to leave it on sum and we're going to choose next at the bottom. So this one is just preview of the report. So it's going to have the vendor, the total defect, the total defect quantity and total downtime in minutes for each vendor. And now we're ready to go ahead and click finish. Once we clicked finish, it puts us in what's known as design view in Power BI report builder. We have a little bit of a quick access toolbar all the way at the top in the upper left. Let's go ahead and click save. And you're going to save this report as supplier quality analysis. Notice the type of report is report definition language RDL. Go ahead and save. So it updates the title bar. We know that we saved the work that we've done so far. The first thing we want to do is we want to sort our report 
in descending order by the sum of the defect quantity. So in that design grid, I'm going to right click in the second, you can see where it says sum total defect, the one that's not bolded. I'm going to right click on that. And on the shortcut menu, I'm going to hover over row group and click on group properties. On the left side of the group properties dialog, I'm going to click on sorting. And I, where it says sort by vendor, I'm going to do the drop down and I'm going to choose total defect quantity. And to the right of that in the order, I'm going to do the drop down and select Z to A for descending. So we could have clicked on any of these fields and done this. I tend to stick to the field that I'm trying to effect change on when I work in here. And at the bottom, I'm going to click OK. So when we ultimately run the report, it will be sorted in descending order by total defect quantity. Go ahead and save again. You want to save as frequently as you can when you're working with the report builder. We can always run the report to see what it will look like at whatever stage of development it's in. If you look up at your ribbon, the home tab of the ribbon, the first button is run. Go ahead and click that button and you'll see that it loads the report. And so we'll see what it looks like at this time. A couple of things I notice is we might not want our headings to wrap within the cell like that. So we might want to make those columns a little bit wider. You'll see that it is sorted in descending order at this point by total defect quantity, which is the sort that we instituted. And you can use control end to get to the bottom and you will see the total line at the bottom of the report. To get back to design view, you only have the run tab up here now, in, in addition to the file tab, but the run tab, the first button is design, and it will take you back to design view. Now we're going to address our column width. So if you click in the little table area there, what you're going to want to do is you want to click above where it says total defect quantity. When you hover your mouse in between the dividing line between total defect quantity and total downtime minutes, your mouse will change to a double headed arrow. I'm going to click and hold and I'm going to just drag it so I see the full title total defect quantity and it's not going to wrap in the cell like it did on when we ran the report. I'm going to also widen the column for total downtime minutes. So we have the same effect where it's not doing a word wrap in there. And I'm going to click away from it. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to replace this report title where it says click to add title, right? We're going to replace that with a text box with our report title in it. And we're going to cause that text box to repeat on every page of the report. So what I'm going to do is I clicked where it said click to add title, but I'm going to click on the border of that. So you get the sizing handles around those little circles and squares. Those are sizing handles. And I'm going to press delete on my keyboard because I want to insert a text box in that area. And we do that from the insert tab on the ribbon. In the report items group, you're going to go ahead and click on text box. And as you move your mouse over your report design, you'll see it looks like a plus sign with a box attached to it. I'm going to click as far as I can get into the upper left corner of the report design canvas. I'm going to click and hold and I'm going to just draw a text box about that size. Your insertion point is already in the text box. So we just need to type the title of this report and that's going to be total defects and downtime minutes per vendor. 
So I'm going to just type it in that text box, total defects and downtime minutes per vendor. And I'm going to select the text. And on the home tab, you have a font group. I'm going to use that big A to increase the font size. So I clicked it once, I'm going to click it again and again. So I clicked that uppercase A to increase font three times for our title. Once my title is formatted the way I want it to be, I'm going to select the text box. Again, it's selected when you have the sizing handles around it. And you'll notice on the right side of your screen, you have a properties window. If your properties window is not showing, you can go to the view tab on the ribbon and check the box in front of properties, and then it will show over on the right. So we're looking at the properties for that text box. The properties are in groups and we want to find underneath other, you're going to click where it says repeat with click to the right of over there. And when you access the drop down to the right of repeat with, you only have two choices, none and tablets one. We're going to choose tablets one, which is basically that table of data on design view. So we're telling it to repeat wherever that table is. So if the table spans multiple pages, the report title will repeat on every page. Go ahead and save your report builder file. We'd also like the column headings for the table, vendor total defect quantity and total downtime minutes to repeat across pages as well. That's a little bit more in depth to get that to happen than the text box that we just did for the report title. So to make those column headings from the table repeat on the bottom of your screen, you'll see row and column groups. If you don't see those boxes on the view tab, you want to check grouping and they will appear at the bottom of your design view. To the right of the column groups heading, there's a down arrow. You're going to click that and select advanced mode. And it just makes everything in those two row and column groups. You have a lot of things that say static now. Under row groups, you're going to click on the first static. And now you'll see on the right, the property screen is different. You have an other section for properties. And you're going to toggle fixed data from false to true. And there's a drop down to the right of false that you can use to select true. You're going to toggle keep together from false to true. And you're going to toggle repeat on new page from false to true. And I made an error in that selection. So toggle keep together back to false. And what I meant to say is you're going to toggle keep with group from none to after. Those are the settings we need to get those column headings to repeat on every page. We need to say that it's fixed data, that we want to keep them with the group that's coming after it. And we want to repeat the heading on new pages. We're going to return to the drop down to the right of column group and turn off advanced mode. And then go ahead and save your report again. Now, if you look at the report data pane on the left side in design view, you have a category called built in fields. Go ahead and expand it. You'll notice the first one is execution time. When is the report executed? When is it run? And that's already in the footer as a placeholder. 
Let's go to the home tab of the ribbon and run the report, the first button. And we'll see that we have our title at the top. We have our column headings. Again, it's sorted in descending order by total defect quantity. If we scroll down, you'll get a sense of how much data is here. So you know that this data is gonna appear over multiple pages. We're gonna use the first button on the run tab to go back to design view and run it again. This time when it loads the data, do control end and it takes you all the way to the bottom and you'll see the footer. That's the execution time built in field that was already placed in the footer section. We can go back to design view now. You have other built in fields that you can use. You know, if you want the page number and the overall total pages, the name of the page, so on and so forth, the report name, that's kind of like placeholder stuff that you can use on your report. I'm going to just save the report again. And now I'm interested in publishing it to the workspace. So on the home tab, the last button is in the share group and it's publish. Go ahead and click on your publish button. Remember you can only publish to a premium workspace. So when I'm on my workspace, notice publish button is dimmed out. That's because that's not a premium workspace. I'm going to click on my power BI video workspace. And then when I click in the file name box, I'm going to type supplier quality analysis and notice my publish button is active here. So I'm going to click it. It lets me know that it's been successful. And right from here, just like when you're publishing from the desktop, I can open supplier quality analysis in Power BI. I'm gonna go ahead and click that link. And it's loading the report in the service. Notice it's in my Power BI video workspace and it generated my report. I want to start by going to the workspace. So I'm going to go up here and use the link to get to my Power BI video workspace. And you'll notice if you scroll down, if necessary, whatever workspace you're in, you have two reports with the same name, supplier quality analysis. Notice the icons are different though. The one that looks like a chart, like a column chart, that's a regular Power BI report icon. The one that looks like a page that kind of has its upper right hand corner folded, that is the paginated report. I'm going to use the link to get to that paginated report so we can go over it. It may take a moment to load it. Shouldn't take too long though. And when you're looking at a paginated report, you have a couple of different views here. The, the second button on that toolbar at the top is view. It's in default view right now. And there's a page navigation area right here where you can click to go to the next page, which it will load. Notice that it's repeating the report title as well as the column headings on the pages. So you can navigate through some more pages and you'll see that in default view. This is the view that if users are consuming this report in the service, this is the view that they'll be using. If I go to the file drop down and choose print report in the lower left hand corner, there's a preview button. At the top, it tells you we'll create a printer friendly PDF version of your report. I'm going to click on preview and it may take a moment to load again, 
But when I preview the report, and there's my page navigation at the top, and I navigate to the next page, it's going to load every time for a page, you'll see that it's not repeating the report title. It's just going to repeat the column headings. The report title is a text box object. So that's really, if you want to repeat it, it's only going to repeat when someone is consuming the report and not actually printing it or exporting it to a PDF. You don't really need that heading to print on every page, but it will show up if I go back to default view, then you'll see it on every page. So an end user can consume it online like this and get that heading on every page. But when it's printed or exported, it's only going to repeat the column headings. So for paginated reports, end users consume it in the service, or you print it and distribute it, or you can export it to any of these formats, Excel, PDF, accessible PDF, you can export it to PowerPoint, Word, so on and so forth, and distribute it that way. Let's go back to the workspace that has the paginated report in it. And let's say you look at your report in the workspace and you decide that you want to make changes to it. If you hover over the paginated report and go to the More Options button, you'll see that the top option is to edit in Power BI Report Builder. Let's click that. And it will relaunch Report Builder for you and it brings up your report. So if you wanted to make any changes in here, let's add something else to the footer area. On the left side, and I can maximize this screen so you're not seeing my workspace behind it. On the left side, I'm gonna expand those built-in fields again and this time I'm going to drag overall page number into the footer section on the left side. And I'm going to save this report. Click in the pane. Oh, it's considering it already saved. I'm going to collapse built-in fields here and I'm going to just click the publish button again. And it's bringing up because I've already published from here, it's bringing up supplier quality analysis and we're going to use the same one. We're going to basically overwrite it by publishing. It lets you know that that, item already exists, you want to replace it. We're going to click on yes. And then you can open it again in Power BI. I'm going to just drag my scroll bar to the bottom and I'll see the page number there and then the date and time that was already in there for the execution date and time. So in this module, you learned what paginated reports are and that they're meant to be consumed in the service or by exporting to a PDF, printing and distributing. There's no option to put them on a dashboard. They're not meant to be consumed that way. You created the multi-page paginated report in Power BI Report Builder by creating and configuring a data source and a data set. We use the table wizard to create our report. We published the report and reviewed the print and export options. You also learned that you can only create a paginated report in a premium workspace. So you learned how to make a workspace a premium one. In module 10, you'll learn how to perform advanced analytics on your reports. You'll be introduced to report features that perform analytical insights into the data. You'll learn how to perform advanced analytics using an AI visual on the report for deeper and meaningful data insights. 
We'll be working in Power BI Desktop after a brief task in the service, and we'll be using the Sales and Marketing Sample Desktop file, and we'll be able to grab that from the service. We'll start with our Advanced Analytics lesson, which contains features like grouping, binning, drill down and up, and analyze. We'll move on to using the Key Influencers AI visual. Then we'll get into creating an animated scatter chart, which is really cool. We'll use a visual to forecast values and end up creating a custom advanced analytics visual. Now would be a good time to get back into Power BI service. So earlier we accessed Microsoft Supplier Quality Analysis sample data, and we brought it into the service and it gave us the data set and the report. We actually ended up putting the report onto a dashboard. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go back to that get data arrow in the lower left-hand corner. We're gonna scroll down and in the lower left, click on samples. And this time we actually want to pull the desktop file, not the report and data set into the service. We actually want to just download the desktop file. So we're going to click on sales and marketing sample tile. And instead of clicking the connect button, which will give us the data set and any reports, we're going to click on learn more right underneath the connect button. It's going to open another browser tab. It gives you all the in-depth information about the data that's in this sample. And underneath get the sample, you can see you can download the dashboard report and data set. If there is a dashboard already in with this sample data In our previous example, it gave us the report and data set. And we got that into the power BI service into our workspace. This time we want to grab the PBIX file, which is the desktop file. You'll notice you can also download the Excel workbook if you want it to. So it walks you through, you can get the sample from the service. If you keep scrolling down, you can get the PBIX file. There's a link there to the PBIX file. So I'm going to click on that link and it's going to start downloading the file for me. Actually, I have it downloading twice because I clicked the link twice, but it's okay. I can stop one of them. And once it's done downloading, I'm going to go to my downloads folder on my computer and copy that file into the working directory that I've been using for this class. And then I'm going to launch it and it's going to open up Power BI Desktop and it will have that data already in it. The first page in the desktop file is an info page. So this data is provided by a company known as Obviance, which works in conjunction with Microsoft. And we don't need that page. So I'm going to just hover over the info page tab and do the little X in its upper right hand corner. It will always prompt you if you're going to delete a page. So I'm going to go ahead and choose delete on the prompt. And it's going to start rendering the images on each of these pages. So we have a market share page, year to date category page, a sentiment page, and a growth opportunities page. If it needs us to use Microsoft R open on a specific type of visual to render it, it would notify you as you saw on the screenshot in the slideshow. The first thing we're going to talk about here is the concept of grouping. In Power BI, you can group fields together and you'll see how this works. I'm on the growth opportunity sheet tab. And in the lower left hand corner, there's a column chart. If I click on that chart and make it active, I can see that they're using the segment field for the axis 
and total units for values. So we're seeing all the segments. If we wanna take a look at the data first, let's go to data view on the left-hand side. And we wanna click on the sales fact table and you can see some of the fields that are in that table. It's a lot of measures in that table, right? We also have a sentiment table, which I'm gonna click on in the fields pane so we can see what's in the sentiment table. If we scroll down in the fields pane, we have the date table, we have a geographical table. Let's expand the manufacturer table or click on it and you'll see the data in there. And we have one remaining table at the bottom, which is product. And the product table is where the segment is coming from. We can go back to report view and that report is still selected on the growth opportunities page. So we know that segment is coming from the product table. Also in the fields list, the tables that have the yellow check mark are the tables that are being used in the visual. So segment is coming from the product table and total units is coming from the sales fact table. Grouping is something that's typically done on a visualization. And for this column chart, we decide that we wanna group the youth and regular segments together. So in the column chart, I'm going to click on youth. I'm going to hold down my control key and click on regular. So both of those segments are selected. I'm going to right click on youth or regular, and I'm going to choose group data. So it flashed on the screen really quickly that it was working on it. And now it's done the grouping. So if you look at your legend, right? It says segment groups. And that's because in your fields pane, it created a group with those two segments in it and it named it segments group. And it added it to the legend in the visualizations pane. So regular and youth are the darker color columns. They're grouped together and all the other segments have the blue columns. So now when you're looking at that column chart, you're actually analyzing the data in a different way because of the groupings. Go ahead and save your sales and marketing sample file. Grouping is typically performed on data fields. Our next topic is about binning, which is performed on numeric fields. We're gonna start this by creating a new chart on a new page. Let's go ahead and click the plus sign to the right of growth opportunities. And we wanna select the clustered column chart visualization in the visualizations pane. And I'm gonna go ahead and expand the size of that chart. We're not going for exact here. And I'm gonna name that new page Benning, just so you have a reference later for what we did on what page in here. If you want to, you can go to the growth opportunities page and put slash grouping after the name. So you'll be able to find your way back to the page where we did the grouping on. So we're gonna build this clustered column chart. Um, we are going to, in the field pane, we're gonna expand the geo table and we're gonna drag region, make sure your chart is selected here. We're gonna drag region to axis in the visualization pane. We're gonna expand the sales fact table and we're going to grab the sales dollars and put that in the values field in the visualization pane. So now we want to create bins for years. Binning is very similar to grouping, except you don't do it on the visualization. 
You do it from the fields pane. And we're going to expand, make sure your date table is expanded in the fields pane. And we're going to right click on year in the date table and choose new group. So because it's a numeric field, this screen looks different. It has group type as a bin and the bin type is size of bins. You only have two choices there for bin type, size of bins and number of bins. We're gonna leave it on size. So this is kind of like, binning is kind of like grouping certain amount of year fields together in one group. And we decide we want our bins to be a size of five, which represents about five years. Go ahead and click OK after you change the bin size to five. And just like a group, it creates a new field in the fields pane. So in your date table, you have your year bins. I actually have two of them in there. I'm going to get rid of one for some reason. But you have your year bins that you just created. And what we're going to do is we're gonna drag year bins to the legend for this visualization. And so now you'll see the legend, right? The bins have coloration, 1995, then the next one is 2000, the next one is 2005, and then 2010. Each bin is consisting of five years. So when I hover over any column on the chart, right? It's telling me, if I hover over the green color, it's telling me it's in the 2010 bin. The orange color is in the 2005 bin, so on and so forth. So binning is like grouping, but grouping different numeric data together. In our case, we're grouping by five years. You will have noticed that both the groups and the bins go into the legend of a visualization. Go ahead and save your file. Our next topic is drill down and up on a visualization. In order for you to be able to drill down and up on a visualization, the visualization must contain a hierarchy. A hierarchy is a container of sorts for related fields. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a duplicate of our binning page. So I'm going to right click on the binning page tab and I'm going to choose duplicate page. I'm going to rename the duplicate of binning to drill down slash up, which is the name of the feature. And the reason why we did this is because we're going to create another column chart that's very similar to this one. So instead of starting from scratch, we're going to just modify this one. So I'm going to select the column chart and I can see that region is in the axis. The year bins is in legend and sales dollars is in values. Well, we're going to create a hierarchy first of the region field and we want it to include the region and the state. So in your fields pane, in your geo table, what you're gonna do is right click on region and choose create hierarchy from the shortcut menu. So now underneath the region field, you have region hierarchy in your fields pane and you can expand that and you'll see that it only contains region because that's the field that we base the hierarchy on. We also want to include the state field in that hierarchy. So we're gonna right click in the fields pane on the state field and choose add to hierarchy and then select region hierarchy. So now we have a hierarchical field which will allow us to use the drill down and up feature. In your visualizations pane, do the X to the right of region in the axis box to get rid of it. 
and we're going to drag the region hierarchy field to the axis box instead. Now a couple of things happened. First though, before I point them out, go ahead and save your file. Now you have additional buttons on your visualization. You'll see three of them in the upper left corner of the visualization, and you'll see another one that just looks like a down arrow over to the right. So when you're using drill down up feature, you have to enable it on the visualization and you enable it by using the down arrow button that's on the right side, the upper right side of the visualization. When you hover over that button, the screen tip will tell you, it says click to turn on drill down. So we're going to just click that button and it enabled the feature. You can tell the feature is enabled because that button now has like a black circle around it. Let's talk about the three buttons that are on the left side above your visualization. In the upper left hand corner of the visualization, you have three other buttons. And those three buttons control how you drill down and up on your visualization. So these three buttons right here do different things. The first one, if you hover over it, it looks like an up arrow and it's currently dimmed out. It's the drill up button. We're at the top level. In our visualization, we're showing the regions right here, east, central, and west. And we have our year bin, so we have that going on as well. The next button, it has the double arrow. And that one is your drill down button. The double down arrows is your drill down button. So we're going to go ahead and click that button. Since state is the next level in our hierarchy, we are at the lowest level of the data because we only have two things in our hierarchy, region and state. So when I hover over that dimmed out double down arrow button, it says you're at the lowest level of your data. If I want to get back to region, I would use the up arrow, which is now enabled, which says drill up. So I'm going to use that. And now I'm back at the highest level, which is region. So by going through the different levels, you're able to analyze your data in different ways. Right now we're analyzing it by region, but we have a third button up there. We actually have a third button on the upper left hand corner. That's part of this feature set. And that third button, if you hover over it, it looks like an upside down pitchfork to me, but if you hover over it, it says expand all down one level in the hierarchy. When I click that button, now I'm seeing the region and the state. So it's combining things. It's another way of analyzing your data. I'm going to go back to the up arrow button, the drill up button, and I'm back to my highest level, which is region. So the drill down and up feature requires a hierarchical field that you can utilize in the visualization. And just by having a hierarchy in your visualization, it will give you all the drill down and up controls on your visualization. Go ahead and save your file. At this point, we decide that we want city to be in our hierarchy as well. So in the fields pane, in the geo table, I'm going to just right click on city, add to hierarchy, region hierarchy, and it updates. So now we'll have another level of drilling down. The feature is still enabled. So now I'm going to do my drill down button and it's going to take me to the state level. And I should be able to drill down again to get to the city level. And it's not letting me drill down to that level. 
So what it did is it added city to our hierarchy, which we can clearly see in the fields pane, but we need to get the city to be in the access box as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uncheck region hierarchy, and then I'm going to drag it back into the access box. So now we have region, state, and city in the access box. I'm going to go back to enable to turn on the drill down feature. So on the right side, and now I'm going to use my double arrows on the left side to drill down. Now I'm looking at the state again, drill down again, and I'm looking at city information and it's overwhelming the chart, which is why we now have a scroll bar in there. I'm going to use the drill up button to drill all the way back up to the top level, which is region. And then I'm going to use my upside down pitchfork to expand all down one level in the hierarchy. And so we're seeing the region and the state. And now that we have another field in the hierarchy, we can click the pitchfork again. And now I'm seeing the region, the state and the city. Go ahead and do your drill up till you get back to just region and save your file. Our last advanced analytic technique that we're going to get into now before we get into artificial intelligence visuals is analyze. It's on every single report page that you have in Power BI Desktop. And to get to the feature, I'm going to still be working on a drill down up page right now. I'm going to just select that visualization and I'm going to right click in a blank area of it and I'm going to hover over analyze and it says find where this distribution is different. Go ahead and click on that and it will bring up a bunch of analysis information that Power BI just scanned all the data and came up with. And so it's saying here are the filters that cause the distribution of sales dollars by region to change the most. So California has 14% of the records, Texas 6.5% of the records, and Florida 6% of the records. And those three most affect the distribution. So it's showing you California here, right? And there's a tab for Texas right there. So I can see that that's in a different region. And in Florida, which is in the East region. And notice at the bottom, it says it's comparing proportions, which it's doing. Now there is a scroll bar to the right of that. And I can see other analysis information that it gave me. So now it's looking at category rural has 36.6% .6 of the record, so on and so forth. I can keep going down and there it is by segment. It did an analysis by segment. There is a calculated column manufacturer is Van Arsdell. So that's coming up there. And so no, 77% of the records don't have that manufacturer is what that's telling you. But this is just Power BI looking at the data, analyzing it and giving you these tiles with the analysis. Now let's say I want to keep a tile. I'm going to just scroll back up to the top and I want to keep this first tile in its upper right. I'm going to click the plus sign to add it to this page. Now there's also a thumbs up and a thumbs down. The Power BI people at Microsoft are really committed to listening to end users. So if these analyses are not good for you, you can give it a thumbs down and say, this is of no use. Or you, if you really like it, you can give it positive feedback. I'm going to go ahead and click the plus sign. So I add it to this page and then I'm going to click on a blank area of the page. And now I'm going to resize my column chart and then resize the analysis that came in at the bottom. I'm going to just make that a little bit taller. 
so I can see it. So that's a built-in feature in Power BI Desktop. It's the Analyze feature, and you get it by right-clicking on a blank area of a visualization. Now we're going to create an artificial intelligence visual, and there are two ways you can access them in the desktop. One way is from using the Insert tab of the ribbon, and the other way is from the Visualizations pane. I'm going to go ahead and click on the Insert tab, and you'll see there is a group called AI Visuals. So you were already introduced to Q&A in Module 8, and we're going to focus on creating a key influencers visual. Now I did a little bit of pre-work. I created a new page, named it Key Influencers. I also created three more pages for upcoming stuff, but you don't have to do those now. Just create a new page called Key Influencers for right now. And then we're going to go up and click the Key Influencers icon on the Insert tab. We want to expand the framework so it fills the canvas. And when we look in the visualizations pane, there are three fields for it. Analyze, explain by, and optionally expand by. We're going to use something that's in the sales fact table to analyze, and that is going to be the sum of revenue. So as soon as we do that, you'll notice that it placed two tabs on your visualization, key influencers, which is the default tab and then top segments. And it gives you what influences sum of revenue to increase. And if you do the drop down, you'll see decrease. We will go over this in its entirety once we're completed the visualization. We're going to end up adding three fields from the product table for the explain by field. So I'm just collapsing sales fact, expanding product. And the first field we want an explain by is manufacturer. So I'm going to just drag it and drop it in there. Now your visualization says no influences found. Try adding some more fields into explain by. So we are. We're going to add the product field underneath manufacturer and explain by. And your visual updated a bit more. Again, we'll review it when we're done. We have one more field that we want to drag underneath product and explain by, and that is the category field. So let's review this visualization. Right now, we're looking at what influences the sum of revenue to increase. The influences are when the manufacturer is one named Van Arsdell and when the category is urban. And it's showing you the average of the sum of revenue increases by, so it gives you the number there. On the right side, you have a chart, a column chart that's built. It tells you the sum of revenue is more likely to increase when the manufacturer is Van Arsdell than otherwise on average. And it's showing you the average, that's the red dashed line, excluding selected, and it gives you a value there. And you're seeing Van Arsdell is the tallest column. Now at the bottom, there's a checkbox. It says only show values that are influencers and we had no change to our chart when we clicked on that. The other thing you can do with this type of visualization is you can hover over the bubble, the 11.5 M bubble there, and it gives you more detailed information, basically just in text form. This influencer contains approximately 12.61% of the data. When I click on that, it makes the chart disappear. And then when I click on it again, the chart reappears. So let's go and see what it looks like when we change the drop down to decrease. So now you have the same chart, but different data. And it's showing 
when the average of sum of revenue decreases by, and it's the other manufacturers, and one category is mixed in there. And you have the information also displaying in the chart, and it gives you the baseline average. Let's go to the top segments tab. When is the sum of revenue more likely to be low? And you have the other option is high. We found five segments and ranked them by average of sum of revenue and population size. You can select a segment to see more details. So I'm going to click on the bubble for segment one. And it opens up more information underneath it. So you're getting the manufacturer is Pomum, and then it gives you more text and graphic detail. I can click on another one and it updates the bottom half. And then I'm going to do the drop down next to low and change it to high. And when I change it to high here, it's only showing the highest segment. I'm going to go back to key influencers and go ahead and save your file. Our next lesson in module 10 is creating an animated scatter chart. Let's go ahead and click the plus sign and we're going to name the page scatter chart. Again, this file will be a great reference file for you after you complete this video course. So what we're going to do in the visualization pane, you're going to locate the scatter chart visualization and click on it. Let's resize it so it takes up like the upper half of the pane. I'll make it a little bit bigger than that. Make it as wide as the canvas. And now we'll start adding fields to populate this scatter chart. So you notice they have several different fields for a scatter chart. We're going to start at the top in the field in the visualizations pane and work our way down. So we are going to want to expand the product table if necessary. And we're going to use the category field for details on this scatter chart. We're going to add our segment groups field to the legend. And from the sales fact table, we're going to want total units year to date. So I'm going to expand that table so I can see the full field name. And we're going to grab total units year to date and drag it to the X access field. We still have more fields to add. So we're going to use the size field here and we're going to use total units from the sales facts table in the size field. And one more for the play axis, we're going to expand the date table and we want to grab the year field, not the year bins, just the regular year field and put it in play axis. So now you'll see your scatter chart. Let's go ahead and save our file. Scatter charts in Power BI come with a play axis. We added year to the play axis field. So there is a play button in the bottom left corner of your scatter chart. And you can click that and you'll see how the scatter chart is animating based on the year. In the upper right hand corner of the chart, it's telling you what the current year is at any given point in time. Press play again and take a moment to absorb the animation and you see the current year again in the upper right hand corner of the scatter chart. It's a really cool feature. So far in this module, we haven't done any formatting on any of the visualizations we created. We'll get to that at the end of the module. We're just two lessons away from being able to format all of the charts we are creating during this module. Right now, we're going to use a visual to forecast values. 
Let's go ahead and create a new page and name it Forecast. Currently in Power BI, the only built-in visual that allows for forecasting is the line chart. So in your visualizations pane, find and select the line chart. We'll go ahead and make the chart about the width of the canvas and slightly taller. And we can always size it after we complete building it. From the date table, we're going to add the date hierarchy to the axis box in your visualizations pane. Add sales dollars from the sales fact table to the values field. And we're not going to add any more fields at this time. You'll see the line chart is showing the years of data. And when you hover over a data point, it gives you the sales dollar value. So far in this course, we've used the fields well, which we've been using now to add fields to our chart. We've used the format well, which is the paint roller. And again, you'll get to go back there at the end of this module. And we haven't used the analytics well. We're going to click on the analytics icon right underneath your visualizations and it opens a whole nother set of categories. One of those, the second one from the bottom is forecast. Go ahead and expand the forecast category. And we're going to click the plus sign for the add button so we can add a forecast to this visualization. Now there's defaults that are already filled out. So you actually see the gray shaded forecast area on the line chart. It's forecasting by default 10 points, which for our purposes and our data equals 10 years. Because we've accessed formatting, we can do the drop down arrow next to points and you'll see the rest of the date hierarchy, as well as the time hierarchy that's within it. We're going to choose years. Nothing's going to change on our chart. We just decide that we want the forecast length to say 10 years. Now we're going to tell it to give us our forecast, but ignore the last two years. So it will use the data set for the forecast, except the last two years. And that's the next setting down. So ignore last in that box, we're going to change the zero to a two and you don't notice anything changing on the chart. You need to scroll down and you'll see an apply link at the bottom of those categories. Go ahead and click apply. And now you'll see the change on the chart. The green line is representing actual data and the black line is representing forecasting data. So we told it to ignore the last two years and that's why you have that green line extending into the gray area. So a forecast is an estimate. The next category down is confidence interval. It defaults to 95%. The confidence interval tells you more than just the possible range around the estimate. It also tells you about how stable the estimate is. Let's see what happens if we change it to 75%. There's a drop down arrow and you can select 75% and click the apply link again. So it narrows the forecast. It's less confident and it's looking at less of a range of data. The next category for forecasting is seasonality. It defaults to auto points. Seasonality refers to predictable changes that occur over a one year period in a business or economy based on the seasons, including calendar or commercial seasons. So we want it to look within a five year cycle of our data. 
we're going to change the seasonality to five points. And again, you're going to click the apply link to make that change show up on the chart. So now it's really looking at a five year cycle within the data set and the shape of the gray shaded area has changed. Go ahead and save your file. Now, if you scroll down farther down underneath forecast, you'll see some formatting options there. The color option will change the shaded area as well as the color of the forecasting line. I'm going to do the color drop down and I'm going to choose an orange color an orange is color. And you can see that the forecasting line is orange and the shaded area in the back, which is showing what is called the confidence band, right? Is also a lighter shade of that orange. If you look at your line style drop down, the line is solid, but you can make it dashed or dotted if you'd like. The forecasting line. The confidence band style is set to fill. So you have that orange, in my case, orange filled background. I'm going to do the drop down and select none there, and it goes away. I actually like having the confidence band, so I'm going to do the drop down again and choose fill again. And if I want that color, that orange band's color to be deeper, I can drag transparency to the left so it's not quite as transparent. And when I let go of the slider, you'll see that it deepened the color. So currently the built-in line chart visualization is the only one that allows for analytics and in particular, the forecasting ability. Go ahead and save your file and create a new page. So we're set up for our next and final lesson. Our last lesson in this module is creating a custom analytics visual. In addition to the visualizations that are built in, you can add custom visualizations in Power BI. That's pending permissions from your admin. And the way to do it is if you hover over the ellipsis button to the right of the last visual, you'll see it says get more visuals. Go ahead and click on it and choose get more visuals. It will take you into the app source which is the tab that it's on by default when you go in here. You also have a My Organization tab. Let's click on that tab. So if your Power BI administrator has added any visuals for the organization, they would be showing on this tab. If not, and if you have permissions, you'll be able to grab some custom visualizations from AppSource. So let's go back to that tab. You'll notice that there's a search box and there are categories. It defaults to the all category. And if you know the name of the visual that you're looking for, you can use the search box. Let's go to the advanced analytics category. And if you start scrolling down, you'll see there's plenty of different custom visualizations in here. Some of them will say in blue underneath them, that they may require additional purchase. Instead of searching through this list, I know the name of the visualization we're looking for. Let's go to the search box and just type violin as in the musical instrument and press enter. And it comes up with the violin plot visualization. It's an advanced analytics visualization and it's used to visualize the distribution of your data. We're going to click the add button to the right of it. After a moment, you'll get a message letting you know that it imported the visual successfully. You can click okay to get rid of that message. Now, when you look in your visualizations pane underneath the get more visuals icon, you'll see the little violin and that's the icon for violin plot. 
it's underneath the visualizations pane, which in Power BI Desktop, that means that you can use it in this file, but if you close this file and open a new instance of Power BI Desktop, it will not be in your visualizations pane and you would have to add it again. The alternative is to pin it to your visualizations pane. So when you find a custom visual that you're going to want to use over multiple files, pin it to your visualizations pane. And you can do that by right clicking the violin plot and choose pin to visualizations pane. It will move its position and it will end up being the last visual in your visualizations pane. Go ahead and click the violin plot visual so we can build this visualization. I'm going to expand the framework so it fills the width of the canvas and I'll make it a little bit taller as well. Now for this visual, we have three fields that we can fill in sampling, measure data and category. The category field can be optional and you'll see how that works as we start building this. So from the products table, we want to use the segment field for sampling. And notice it gives you a message. Please ensure that you have added data to the sampling and measure data fields. You can also supply an optional category to plot multiple violins within your data set. We're going to use all three fields. So the next field is measure data. And from the sales fact table, we're going to grab the sales dollar field for measure data. And then for the category, we're going to go back to the product table and use the category field for category. So that caused us by using the category field that caused us to have multiple violins. They're broken down by category. They have different shapes. If you notice the legend in the upper left hand corner, so your sales dollars are the in my case, aqua colored parts of the violin. You'll see the median value is the white line in the violin. And the mean value is the circle that's in the violin. And sometimes they're in the same position. So if you hover over your different violins, you'll see that it gives you the name of the category the number of samples, the maximum, minimum, median, mean, and standard deviation values. So a violin plot chart shows the distribution of your data. Go ahead and name that page violin and save your file. Now would be a good time for you to pause this video if you'd like, so you can go back and apply some formatting options to the visualizations we created in this module, starting with the binning page. In module 10, you got to explore advanced analytics by using grouping, binning, drill down and up and analyze features. All of them give you different ways of looking at your data to analyze it in different ways. You were able to create a time series analysis with the animated scatter chart. That was really kind of cool. We use some AI artificial intelligence visuals, some of which identified outliers in our data. And that would include the Q and a, our decomposition tree, the key influencers visual, and how to summarize on a report. All of those are really cool features that give you different insights into your data. And we ended up by using the advanced analytics custom visual, the violin plot, which shows the distribution of data. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit learnit.com for more details.
please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing Learn It.